Today's episode of the Ryan Rosillo Show on the Ringer Podcast Network is brought to you by State Farm. Just like basketball, the game of life is unpredictable. Talk to a State Farm agent and get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected. Um, Not unexpected. I think Bill House and I were texting about a three-hour All-Star game podcast. Um, And that would be All-Star game selections. Snubbed is always one of my least favorite things really in sports like sometimes people get snubbed and then sometimes it's like hey here's an idea there's this many all-stars and some guys aren't going to make it that's all nothing personal um some coaches have rules about you can't be in a losing team but then sometimes guys have such great individual seasons that you can't help but vote them onto the all-star team i haven't looked at it once so i am ready to go i just keep seeing like guys in the lakers are really high in the fan voting uh and then as bad as we all think the fan voting is this is really what the all-star voting story has become is which players voted for who and like how many guys voted Pat Connaughton an all-star not dumping on Pat Connaughton, but I'm just, you know, I think it's safe to say, I don't think it's breaking news that he would be one of the best players in the East. Get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected like Pat Connaughton or talk to a state farm agent today. Here's the plan. Uh, Excited to do another book review. Bruce Lee, I've talked about it a little bit. The interview is going to be incredible. It's Matthew Polly. Before we do that, fresh off a flight back from New Orleans, off LSU's national championship win against Clemson, I just want to share a few things with you. I you know have have been going to LSU games since 2008. The first game I ever went to was Saban's return. Nick Satan, you know, they have a turnover in overtime, and LSU loses this game that they weren't supposed to win, and it's like the worst way to lose. You wanted to show up Saban because they felt like, you know, this is ridiculous. Saban gets this place up and running. He leaves for the Miami Dolphins, apparently doesn't like the job, and then goes back to the SEC, but goes back to the SEC West. And the guy who you know got you your title and helped set the foundation for the 2007 title is now at Alabama. And if you understand the Bama LSU back and forth, I mean, look, LSU hadn't beaten Bama since 2011 until they went to Tuscaloosa and beat them this year. So that was my first experience of it. I'd been to an Auburn game, and that was my first SEC game. Uh, I've been to Florida. I've, I've mentioned it. I've been to 10 of the 14 SEC schools. And the LSU one was just a little different. You know, I, I was at a Penn State game a couple of years ago, and, and a Penn State kid was like, hey, this is the best place you've ever been, I bet, right? I'm like, eh, it's really good. It's really good up here, but it's not, it's not the best. And then, you know, you always kind of do this thing, like how many places have you been to? He's like, well, I've been to Penn State, Ohio State, and Miami of Ohio. And you're like, well, okay, I'm going to get, just, I would just suggest you get out a little bit more. And then uh, maybe after a couple of years, you get back to me and let me know where, uh, where everything ranks. And Penn State's atmosphere is incredible. So it's not a knock on that. But my point is that for whatever reason, I just kept deciding that I was going to do the LSU Bama game every year. And I've only missed, I think, one since 2008. And after LSU lost that game, I remember going to my buddy, you know, that night and and he's an LSU guy. And I go, this is, that's too bad. I was like, tonight's going to be lame. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, it's Louisiana. They're not going to let a lost Alabama get in the way of a good night. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. And you would have thought they won the national championship instead of having, you know, honestly, one of the most heartbreaking losses they could have had because of all the saving stuff. So, you know, I was there in 2011 when it was the unbelievable 9-6 game, which is actually believe it or not, fun because of the stress level. I was there for the rematch in New Orleans, which didn't go uh, as well for LSU there. And then it just became this kind of complex for LSU, where here's Les Miles winning all these games, but feeling like his offense is completely outdated. And, you know, I remember one LSU-Bama game where leading up to the week, Les apparently like bought into the game planning on Monday, and then Tuesday kept getting a little bit more more worried Thursday. He's like, I think we can run it right at Alabama. And then on Friday, everybody's like, great, we're going to run it right up Alabama with Leonard Fournette, and it's not going to work. And Fournette got totally shut down on one of those games that I went to. Uh, and then there was the back-to-back LSU home games where they didn't score. So despite LSU being one of the best programs for putting pros in the league, and they are, as far as having consistently the highest level of recruits other than, you know, Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, and other teams that get up there and flirt. Like, they're at five-year averages, LSU's right up there. But it was it was this thing where it's like, is it going to be Tom Herman? Would Chip Kelly ever come down there? 
And then here's this guy, Ed Orgeron from Lafouche, um, a place that some would say don't, don't speak English. Uh, I don't understand any of those Bayou towns either. I'd love to explore it a little bit, but just doesn't ever seem like it, it it's in play. Um, you know, Coach O, I had met at USC. You know, he had this USC gig. He won a few games as the interim. It was the second time that he'd been at USC. You know, he was retained off a of Hackett staff by Pete Carroll because Pete Carroll's like, I like this guy. And everybody knew when you brought in Coach O, you could recruit, but the old Miss thing was all over him. So if you're an LSU fan, you're like, it's great. He's one of us. And I mean, this is Louisiana people saying it, not a kid from Massachusetts. Um, he was somebody that you were like, man, I hope this works. But there was real hesitation because it was really bad at Ole Miss. And then you start to think, hey, there are coordinators and there are, he's not even really a play caller. He's a D line coach who's a great recruiter. He won National Recruiter of the Year. Bruce Feldman wrote a really good book, Meat Market, uh, all about the recruiting exploits, especially with that Ole Miss team. So, it was, even though it was like, he sounds like us, he gets us, he's at his dream job, is this really going to work? And I remember interviewing him, I think it would be 16, I was down there for the Bama game, and I asked him, how did you feel about like kind of stabilizing that USC thing, and then them not even really taking you seriously as a candidate? And he got upset. His answer was really revealing. And it, it made me a little bit emotional because I was like, man, and yet here he is. And it is one of those lessons. I can't tell you this. And I know if you're younger, you, you don't want to hear it. But how many times I didn't get something and it turned out to be the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And that can happen in relationships, but I don't really look at it that way. I look at it more as your career. And here's Coach O who wanted nothing more than to be retained as the USC head coach. And now three, four years later, he's winning a national title with LSU. Now, I've heard some people say, well, you know, he's never called plays and why does everybody obsess with coordinators? I don't know that the lesson here is, hey, find a good recruiter who's flamed out at another Power 5 program. I don't think that that's what you would want to do if you were an AD recently hired at a big program going, what I'm looking for is guys that have failed dramatically. There is no blueprint to this. Um, and I've read more and more like, hey, people need to have more of an open mind, not be in love with the coordinator. Maybe you shouldn't be in love with all the coordinator stuff. but He's just different because I, as I thought about, hey, what would you do if not that I'm ever going to be an AD, but like you talk about it enough, what would you do if you had to hire somebody? What would be your criteria? And I'd give a great recruiter and guys have to want to play for him. And everywhere he's gone, his players love him. Now, as far as the game's concerned, 17-7, about 10 minutes left to go. Uh, I didn't really... I wasn't really worried because LSU was starting at its own like three yard line those first couple possessions. And the crowd was there was actually a lot of Clemson people there, but you know, look, it's a it's a national championship in Louisiana. So, you know, I don't expect anybody to be like, hey, that's an easy game there for Clemson. But here's here's the deal. Here's what it was. It was a poorly officiated game, but it was poorly officiated both ways. Those Pac-12 officials, like there's all sorts of jokes to be made about. Well, at least the Pac-12 did make an appearance in the playoffs at some point. And I'm not a big anti-officials guy. But I just thought both ways, like you couldn't figure it out. Late flags on stuff. We were like, Wait a minute, what did you guys see there? But LSU wins this game and they win it convincingly. And it does. And I'm not going to do this thing like, hey, I was right. I was right. I was right. Because I was. But it, it's not even about being right. Because there's plenty of times where you, you know, you're just wrong about stuff all the time. So maybe you take the wins and you do the victory lap and you puff your chest out. But what I never could understand this year is that. I would see some voices arguing against LSU despite the resume being what it was. And they had a lower strength of schedule like the first half of the season because they had that Northwest Louisiana State game in there. So it messed up their numbers. I kept telling you guys about the defense all year where, yes, the stats aren't great. They're still a little bit better than you think they are. But a lot of the times they're giving up points is when they're up big. So if you're telling me after watching Clemson do what they did all season that somehow that's a bad defense and holding Clemson to 25, three touchdowns. I don't, I don't get it. Like I, I just, I just would say stop watching all Ohio state games because I've saw that from people. And I'm talking about guys in the media where, it, and I've said this all year. If you thought Ohio state was better than LSU, I wouldn't argue against it. I would just say, I disagree because I think it's really close. 
But when it's, hey, Ohio State's the best and it's not even close, change the bleeping channel every now and then. Because there's no way you could have watched LSU all year and thought, yeah, there's another team that's way better than those guys. Somehow, because Tua was hurt after the Alabama game and maybe he was a little gimpy in it, I thought he was terrific in that game. So, you know, I was there. I watched it. I came away loving Tua even more after that game. But going into Tuscaloosa was met with a collective like, eh. They beat Alabama in Alabama. Nobody does that. They smashed Georgia. They smashed Oklahoma. And after being down 10, they went on like a 35-8 run to close out a national title game against a really good Clemson team who maybe has the better quarterback. And I saw tweets, you know, during the game, maybe Burrow's off, maybe Burrow's wrong here. How, how do you hit send on that? And then he throws like 500 yards. So that's, uh, that's it. They won. It was fun. You don't have to hear me talk about LSU. Uh, we won't be doing a lot of breaking down of the recruiting there. But really cool stuff, um, getting to know Coach O those years ago and interviewing him and seeing him be emotional and having something come full circle when you thought for sure that once you don't get the USC job, it'd have to be an impossibility that one day he'd be coaching LSU and coaching LSU to a national championship. Okay, let's talk Bruce Lee with Matthew Polly. The book is Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly. Matthew Polly joins us now. Uh, I love this book. I knew I was going to love it. Uh, I love your story, which I do want to share with our listeners at the end of this because you're about as unique a guy as it gets. Um, but Bruce was somebody, as I've seen in, in some of your lectures, who became more famous. You know, this guy's pursuit of fame and fortune, which was clearly a driving factor in his success. Unfortunately, he died before he understood the iconic status that he would reach, um, although that was starting to happen certainly back home and then and carried over here. So just to set it up for the listeners, Bruce Lee born November 27th, 1940 in San Francisco, which I know will surprise some people. His father was a theater performer, a comedic actor who has his own amazing story where he was singing outside of a restaurant and some traveling theater group saw him and then took him in and he traveled with them. Um, his background isn't uh, 100% Chinese. As you mentioned, uh, he had a Dutch Jewish grandfather which cha who changed his name. So that was kind of hard to figure out. I know for years people thought he was of German descent as well. That was not the case. It was actually English. Um, and that led to a bunch of problems that, that he was not 100% Chinese. But he was a child star, Matthew. And I think that's kind of the foundation of, for those of us that didn't understand it, his father was a performer and Bruce was a performer for a very long time at a very young age, 20 films by the age of 18. How much do you think that kind of set up his own aspirations for himself once he started traveling and going back to the United States? I think that's the key I found in researching the book because the image of Bruce is this martial arts master who kind of accidentally gets into movies. It's almost as if he's the real person on screen as opposed to an actor playing characters. And when you realize that his first appearance was when he was three months old uh, and his career starts in earnest at six and you see him play all sorts of roles that have nothing to do with kung fu movies you realize that he was an actor following in his father's footsteps and in many ways i think he was driven by that kind of oedipal conflict to outdo his father who was quite famous in hong kong when he was growing up yeah and it almost was you know, anyone that's trying to do this kind of stuff to become famous, right? Hey, I want to be a big movie star. Like you have to be wired a certain way and him having that kind of success early on. And he, he was actually like, would and correct me at any point throughout this if I'm off on anything, but he was, he was starting to have some major roles there where he was, he was a star. So I think he, once he goes to the United States, we're going to get to here. It's almost like, look, I, I expect to have the same level of success as absurd as that may have sounded at that time. That's right. I think it gave him a real uh, confidence and, and some would say arrogance that he was somebody who was sort of fond over from a very young age. He was on set. Everyone thought he was cute. He, you know, by the time he was 10, he was he started in a very successful movie. Then his career took a little bit of a dip. But the last film he uh, was in, The Orphan, was a huge hit and was the first film that ever played in an international film festival. So Bruce Lee thought of himself as a an important person. He was a celebrity in Hong Kong. And so when he came to America, he didn't feel like somebody who just snuck off the boat and was desperate to like just survive. He thought he should be a big deal here too. And I think he needed that because the kind of racial barriers he faced were so high. And if he hadn't had that kind of fundamental confidence, he never would have achieved what he did. 
So before he leaves for the States, he's in school. He's a terrible student. But, yep. and I, I cannot express this enough, and, and you hammer it in the book, and this is something that I kind of heard. Like, this was not some fake martial arts guy that maybe we grew up with in the 80s and 90s. That Bruce Lee was a legitimate street fighting badass that would fight anybody. And he was training um, with, with not necessarily different styles. It was more of the traditional styles. And, and uh, Ip Man, who was somebody who, you know, becomes famous himself or was famous at the time. Like people didn't want him training with him. Can you share with us just how real of a guy Bruce was and that he was much more concerned with fighting almost anyone who wanted to fight him, even if he wasn't winning more than he was trying to be a student or some pretty boy on, on film? That's right. What's interesting is from a very young age, he seemed to have a chip on his shoulder. And he was the kid who was always going around saying, you, you, got, you got trouble with me? Like he was starting fights. He wasn't, this wasn't self-defense. This was self-offense. And the only reason he took up martial arts is because he got into so many street fights. He finally found a guy who was better than him. And this guy studied uh, under Ip Man, the style of Wing Chun. And Bruce Lee only took it up because he wanted to be better than the guy who had beaten him in a fight because he couldn't stand the idea that he wasn't the best street fighter in the neighborhood. And so martial arts to him was simply an extension of street fighting. It wasn't the other way around. He wasn't a bullied kid who got picked on and started studying martial arts, the kind of classic tale that we're all sympathetic to. He was a genuine sort of rough around the edges, tough guy who liked to start things. And martial arts uh, was an extension of his sort of aggression. Um, And in fact, he was so aggressive that the only reason he ended up going to the States was because the police were going to arrest him if his parents didn't do something about his constant street fighting. Yeah. Did he, did you, and I know that there was different pieces and it was kind of great going through stuff and then reading the book and being like, man, you know, Polly really cleans it up as much as you possibly could. But did he, was he actually, was there a hit on him from the triads for beating up like the son of a gang member? <laughs> That's a, Yes, I, I think that's a story that um, one of his friends from uh, high school tells. Uh, unfortunately, that friend tends to tell tall tales, um, <laughs> and he's the only one who says it. So I, I, I think what happened was that he he beat up somebody who was important, but not a triad member, because in general, triad members settle things themselves. They don't go to the police for it. So um Basically, he beat up the kid of a, a well-to-do family who didn't have access to thugs to settle it themselves, and so they went to the police. Did he pull a knife on a teacher? He did. <laughs> he did. He had a teacher. The PE teacher used to, when they were running around the track, would take a long uh, a weed, essentially long switch of grass, and switch the kids on the back of the legs if they were going too slowly. Um, and it hurt and they didn't like it, but Bruce Lee brought a switchblade in his pocket, his shorts. And one day when the, the PE teacher whipped him, he turned around, flipped the blade open and charged the PE teacher who immediately ran away. And Bruce Lee was chasing across the field, the PE teacher with a knife in his hand. So this isn't like he was kind of a bad boy. This is, you know, the genuine article. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So 1959, Um, he goes to the States, he graduates, uh, I believe a technical high school, he enrolls in Washington. Um, he drops out, not immediately from, from the timeline that I, that I have, but what was going on with him and kind of his, his move to the United States, his thoughts. I mean, I know he's working in a restaurant, but now he's practicing martial arts and he's kind of entering that first, whether or not people thought it was bullshit or what, you know, not, because I think there's some real truth in the book where it's like, at times he could have been a little annoying with his philosophical stuff, but he's clearly, you know, figuring himself out through these transitional years before we get to kind of the Hollywood chapter and understanding how important he is to martial arts. Yeah, so what's fascinating about his story is when he got to America, he 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 had that kind of instant, almost instant immigrant turnaround story where he decides, I want to be a success here. The way my life was going in Hong Kong was bad uh, and was leading towards a dark place. How can I change this? So uh, he didn't become a a student, but he became a much more dedicated student. He got into the University of Washington. He fell in love with philosophy um, and took that up as uh, one of his main interests. Um, But I think the more important thing was he 
because he came from Hong Kong, which at that time was not a major film industry, was basically like the Nigerian film industry. Like it was popular in the region, but no one else watched their films. He never thought it was possible to be an actor in the States. And so he decided that the way he was going to make a living in America was to teach Kung Fu to everyone and open a sort of chain of Kung Fu um, kind of McDojos across the country. He wanted to be the Ray Kroc of Kung Fu. And so uh, it was at the University of Washington where he realized he could get Caucasian students interested in signing up for his classes. And that made him sort of the first Kung Fu instructor to teach a kind of non-Chinese audience. And that's what's interesting is that he it mentally gave up the idea of being an actor for about four or five years, but it ended up catching up with him anyway. So for a while, all he thought about was martial arts and martial arts instruction. And then that led him to rejoin his acting career. There's some really revealing stuff about how ahead of his time he was when you think about nutrition, the exercises, working with weights. I mean, this is somebody who was was as wiry, as sinewy as, as you can imagine as, as far as his physique, but it wasn't all genetics. Like he was eating these basically smoothies before they were called smoothies, right? Like peanut butter, bananas, eggs, even raw hamburger meat. And he would just drink these things and he was doing all sorts of exercises, working with dumbbells, concentrating. Like at this point, it feels like this is when he's deciding that whatever I'm going to be, I'm going to be physically tuned as perfectly. Like he feels like the first or the closest thing we have to an actual superhero as he's learning his craft and obviously supplementing it with everything that he can get his hands on that he thinks is healthy for him, which again, felt like very, maybe you could say, Hey, it's the sixties. A lot of people are doing that kind of stuff, but at least reading this stuff, I'm like, I feel like I see these posts from girls doing deadlifts on Instagram all the time. And he was doing it in the sixties. <laughs> That's right. Well, what it what's interesting is it was such a niche thing in America, the sort of weightlifting craze and some of the magazines that were the equivalent of, say, muscle and fitness at that time. But Bruce instantly gravitated towards those. And it would have been easy. You know, it took 30 or 40 years before that overtook American culture in general. Um, but at that time, it was just such a small group of people who were into protein shakes and vitamins. But Bruce immediately gravitated towards it, I think partly because he grew up, he almost died as a, uh, a baby um, during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong. And so he grew up physically more frail than the other boys. And this always bothered him. And I think he saw this as a way to make up for a childhood deficit. But then clearly he realized something that no other martial artist at the time realized, which is this kind of weightlifting regimen could really enhance your skill level. Um, in the same way that athletes of that era didn't lift weights or do any of the things that they do now. And so he was really kind of on the cutting edge of the modern athlete um, who went from somebody who simply played the sport to studying scientifically how to physically uh, gain the kind of strength, endurance, et cetera, to increase their skills on the playing field. When did he start to make the transition from all the stuff that he had learned, more traditional stuff, to what he then called Jeet Kune Do that clearly pissed off the traditionalist, but he was, I mean, this is maybe the most impressive thing that he's done where he just took it all and said, okay, none of this is right. This is what's going to work and, and essentially created his own philosophy and approach to fighting. Yeah, so Jeet Kune Do is interesting because from the very beginning, he had a fairly open attitude towards martial arts and he studied different things, but he never uh, emotionally could break away from the Chinese system until he was older. And what I think about it is the martial arts is from the East is fundamentally conservative. You always look back to your master style and say what you were, and no one was really allowed to go out and try to look forward as to how I'm going to change this to make this better or how to make my art a progressive art that always improves a kind of more scientific Western approach. And it wasn't really until he had a fight with a famous fight in San Francisco with a, a man by the name of Wong Jack Man, who, uh, during that fight, Bruce Lee won, but it was a really ugly win. Can, can I interrupt that, you there? Because I, I'd actually, yeah. before we kind of do what, because this is one of my favorite parts sure. of the entire book. And you know, this yeah. is the one where I was calling guys being like, you have to. So give me the lead up to the Wong Jack Man thing, because there had been for years, decades, 
completely opposing views of what happened, the lead up, what the fight was, and, and what they believed it was sure. afterwards. So do that, and then we'll transition back to the Jeet Kune Do thing. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, the legend of the fight of Bruce Lee and Wong Duck Man is that um, Bruce Lee was open to school in Oakland, and he was teaching Caucasians, and this offended the Chinese community of San Francisco, who sent a Wong Duck Man as an enforcer to stop Bruce from teaching the white man their secret kung fu. This turns out to be totally fictitious. What actually happened was... Bruce Lee had been going around giving demonstrations in order to try to get students to come to his school. And during these demonstrations, he was saying, my style of Wing Chun, uh, taught by the master at Mon, is better than all of your styles. And he went on stage in San Francisco in Chinatown and said, um, what you guys are doing is bunk and it's terrible and mine's better. And because he was so brash and arrogant, he offended the entire audience. Um, and so people were talking about how they had to challenge him and Wong Jack man sort of volunteered to be the one to show this punk, um, what was what. And so the whole fight itself started because Bruce was so brash and arrogant. Um, and that's what led up to the Wong Jack man, Bruce Lee fight. So I had read like Wong Jack man said afterwards that he had won and that Bruce gave up because of his conditioning and then there's other people like, no, no, this thing, like Bruce was ready to go for the kill immediately. And then he dominated the fight. And then I've also had read, and this is all just part of the, the lore of this thing that Wong Jack Man was like, I thought this was just simply going to be a demonstration and all this different stuff. And then yet they were like, wait a minute, you had this illegal substance, like these cuffs that could cut people open. So why would you have that on your outfit if you were acting as if there was going to be some peaceful demonstration. So what do you know as far as the closest to the reality of what happened in the fight? So I, uh, you know, for years, the two sides, Bruce Lee's side and Wong Jack Man's side, have been arguing over what happened in this event that only about 11 people were there for. Uh, and and they locked the doors, the right? Like, this is right out of a movie scene. Like, this is that real. Is right. We're going to fight. But the other side came in and, and they had like six people. And so... Bruce's friend locked the door so nobody else could come in. And he actually had a gun there in case things got out of control. So it was tense. Um, and it was, it was the real thing. Like no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, and initially they, there was some talk about like, let's make this light sparring. And Bruce Lee was so angry at this point that he was, he said, you know, there's no rules. This is, you know, we're just going to fight like it's on the street. Um, but I was able to talk to a man by the name of David Chen, who was Wong Jack Man's friend and had helped arrange the, fr the fight itself. Um, and he told me basically what he saw happen, which uh, aligned with most of the people that I talked to as well. And what happened was Bruce Lee from the very beginning, instead of shaking hands or touching gloves, he immediately shot out a sort of finger jab at Wong Jack Man's eyes and jabbed him right above the orbital, um, momentarily stunning Wong Jack Man, who desperately tried to defend a flurry of attacks from Bruce. And this flurry essentially panicked Wong Jack Man, who ended up turning around and running away. And so for a while, it was like some cartoon where this Wong Jack Man was running and Bruce was trying to punch him in the back of the head. Um, and eventually, uh, Wong Jack Man turned back around. And as you mentioned, he had secretly worn um, metal studded wrist uh, a weapon. Uh, and he he swung it around and hit Bruce in the neck, which is an illegal thing to wear a secret weapon in a, a unarmed combat uh, challenge match. And Bruce was so angry that he charged at Wong Jack Man, and eventually Wong Jack Man toppled over, and that Bruce was on top of him swinging punches, and Wong Jack Man's friends had to pull Bruce Lee off. And that's how the fight ended. So in that situation, it's pretty clear who won the fight. Yeah, because the other one was that it went on for 30 minutes and that Bruce was was gave up. And um, I was just right. like, I don't know. I mean, of all the people to never give up, like Bruce is the kind of guy you're going to fight. You're like, you're going to have to kill this guy. Because That's right. Just you would have to shoot stop. Bruce Lee to, to, to get him to quit fighting. And also, um, you know, people tell those stories have never been in a fight. Like <laughs> most human beings can't fight for longer than five or six minutes before they're completely exhausted. Uh, as far as we know, the fight lasted, you know, about 
three minutes plus. Um, it was a huge flurry of back and forth. Um, and at the end of it, Bruce felt quite exhausted as one does because there's a huge adrenaline surge and dump. Uh, and this led to his eventual taking up of uh, Jeet Kune Do. Right. And he even, I think, despite winning the fight, as you point out, like he realized conditioning wise, like that's amazing. He wins the fight. And then it's, his first thing is my conditioning is not where it needs to be. Like I, whatever I'm doing, I need to abandon this and kind of start over. And then Jeet Kune Do happens and nobody really wants to mess with him anymore. So let's, let's get to it. Cause I, I feel like I could have gone forever on the fighting stuff alone, but uh-huh. this, this, it feels very quickly around this time to the next step in his life feels like a rapid pace, a uh, level of like, okay, I'm this guy. I'm broke all the time. I'm working in this restaurant. I'm fighting with people. I'm opening up these dojo. I'm trying to get people involved. And now I'm on television. How does that transition happen? And how does it happen so quickly? I think what's interesting about Bruce is because he was such an actor at heart, this was really how he started out in the world. Um, when he was trying to recruit um, students to come to his schools, which weren't doing that well, because it's very hard to start a martial arts school. Um, he really developed his own persona on stage, the kind of thing we now we can see in the movies, this Bruce Lee, the martial arts master. And it was almost like, I felt like it was a stand-up comedian kind of honing his act. And each time he gave her a performance, he got better and better at charming the crowd, wowing them, awing them. And eventually he gave a, you know, a demonstration at a karate tournament outside of Los Angeles. And through that, a TV producer found him. And the TV producer ended up casting him as Kato in Kung Fu. So in a weird way, it was sort of like he was doing off-Broadway plays. <laughs> and somebody saw him and was like, that's the guy I need to cast. So his big breakthrough came from trying to get students to his martial arts school, but really because he had the charisma and charm of a child actor. Did he think that after Cato, like this, it was on? Because I mean, certainly he spent that way. Um, he would he would spend money as soon as he got it. At this point, um, I believe he's had a second child, correct? Uh, or was uh, yeah, the second one on the way? Had a second child during Cato, but okay, uh, he had his first. Brandon had been born, um, mm. and yes, I think. Um, it came sort of out, so out of the blue um, that his assumption was that he'd sort of made it. And Bruce Lee in, inherently had that kind of confidence where he was the kind of person who always believed he would win. Things would just come to him. It's one of the reasons he did spend money like water, because he just assumed that good things were going to happen to him and they didn't have to worry about the future. So as soon as he was cast as Cato, I think he really did believe that his this had launched his career and he was set. And it came right. to and so, great shock to him when it was canceled, and suddenly he was an, an out of work actor. Right, and Cato was was the Green Hornet. This is pre the, the Kung Fu. Um, really, I don't even know how to. You can't say controversy. I mean, he thought he was going to be the lead character in Kung Fu, and um, I I just don't want to leave out the the kickboxing part of this because I the timeline would go from Cato to then. This is kind of the kickboxing world. And then him doing some demonstrations and then Chuck Norris. And it, it feels like this is what kind of put him back on the map after just being a guy who had a really hard time as a man from Hong Kong getting just bit parts in television That's shows. Right. So uh, and, and I, I, I especially I want to make sure I'm kind of reminding myself in the interview of, of asking about his, I thought, very realistic approach of how hard it was for him to get work. But how did the kickboxing world and those demonstrations and then some of that stuff, where he, and it's funny because the kickboxing, these kickboxing legends, these world champions never really wanted to admit that they were training under anyone else, certainly not Bruce Lee, but that's, that's basically right. exactly what was happening. Yeah, so uh, what's interesting is when he couldn't get work, um, he became the martial arts instructor to the stars. Um, And so he he trained people like Steve McQueen and James Coburn, but he also was really interested in training the top uh, karate point fighters of that era, which the ones we know, Chuck Norris, but also lesser known Mike Stone and Joe Lewis who were the most famous guys within American martial arts scene. Uh, And so Bruce, in many ways, sought to sort of attach their legitimacy to his. Uh, And because he was so sort of charismatic, but also innovative and smart about the way he thought about martial arts, much differently than the traditional masters of that time, each one of those uh, 
karate point fighting stars uh, became sort of his student. But as you mentioned, they were really proud guys. And so they would just say, you know, we work out together, even though it was Bruce who was doing most of the teaching. So he and Chuck Norris would go to Bruce's backyard and work on stuff for, you know, a three or four hour lesson. Uh, And then that was stuff that Chuck would use in the point fighting ring, you know, and at that time, karate was like the new hip thing. It was kind of the MMA of its era. And so you would get crowds of 10 or 20,000 people coming to Madison Square Garden to see Chuck Norris fight Joe Lewis in a point fighting tournament. And Bruce Lee would be brought on stage as the guy who played Cato and who was, you know, friends with Chuck. So this really kind of established him as a celebrity within the martial arts world in America in the late 1960s. Okay, more from Matt on this book and this amazing story. But today's podcast is sponsored by ADT Commercial for Business. ADT Commercial serves businesses ranging from mid-sized organizations to large-scale enterprises. Think of them as a special team who has one focus, your business security. They provide a comprehensive line of security, fire, life safety, and risk management solutions. Professional-grade systems for commercial-grade businesses with ADT Commercial. Every day is game day. Fortune 1000 companies rely on ADT Commercial for highly complex, scalable, integrated solutions that help solve their unique business challenges. And if you're looking for a partner to upgrade or to take over the monitoring and service of your current system, ADT Commercial can help to painlessly install and maintain large-scale and multi-site businesses. They make it easy to switch providers. Their onboarding is predictable, dependable, and painless. Schedule a no-obligation security review with ADT Commercial for Business. No pain. That's good in sports and good in business security. Visit ADT.com forward slash game day. To learn more, that's ADT.com forward slash game day. So he's trying to figure out the next move. He I obviously been pursuing the, the TV part of this. And everybody seemed to love him um, when he actually was on TV, like going through it and being like, hey, he, he's actually very charismatic. He, as you point out, him, he had the acting gene in him. Um, the martial arts community is like, you guys don't understand what we're watching on the screen here. Like you, you've got to – I remember, and again, this is me as a skinny kid in high school um, mm-hmm. with, with self-confidence issues like a lot of kids growing uh-huh. up. And going, you know, I saw these dudes doing Muay Thai and Savat and beating up on each other. And I was like, hey, can I learn some of this stuff? And they would look, take it easy on me. So it wasn't like I pretended to be some badass. Um, they were just doing me a favor. And I would, you know, kick with them. And it was, this was an after-school routine for a couple of years. And the way they talked about Bruce Lee in those movies, they're like, hey, well, have you seen Enter the Dragon? Have you seen Fist of I'd be like, well, yeah, I've seen it. They're like, go back and watch it. And I was like, these are grown men that are in absolute awe of what they've watched. And, you know, at that point, when I was in high school, it's still 20-something years removed from the movies coming out, that yep. the – the point cannot be emphasized enough that despite what you thought of him as, as this big screen actor, it's that he was that revered and he was really considered a guy that almost no one could ever beat. You know, it, they did. They, uh, you know, the top guys of that era came to him to learn. Um, and they were confident, cocky guys too. So they, they would never say we couldn't be Bruce Lee. If you ask Chuck Norris, he always dodges that question, but, um, everybody in the martial arts community knew he was somebody special, uh, and that he had talents that others didn't One, He was so innovative, but also he just was incredibly fast. And one of the things you see when you watch him on screen is that just incredible speed, um, that no one else has really been able to match. Uh, and he also had it ton of power for somebody that small. You know, he's about five foot seven, 130 pounds soaking wet, um, but he could hit like a heavyweight. So that combination of speed and power, that's deadly. Um, and he was, he was an inherently aggressive guy because he was a street fighter as a kid. So he had all the combinations of great martial artists and he happened to be a really uh, successful and skilled actor. And that's probably what makes Bruce Lee, you know, a legend today is that We've never seen anyone who could do both uh, like he could. And that's what made him so special. I liked his honesty, whether, you know, it was an interview or him telling a story to somebody where he was like, look, it's really hard for me in Hollywood. I don't speak great English. And I think in the book, you have moments where the producers that sat down with him and they're like, yeah, we love him. He's really charismatic. We're like, how do I cast this guy as a leading man? 
the United States in the 60s when his English is this bad. And even he, you know, despite, hey, this is racist or in some of the sensibilities that we apply today to decades ago, um, which I, I don't know if it's the right thing to do or if it's a mistake, but he seemed to be one of the most realistic about it going, look, I mean, it's just sort of a challenge, despite the fact that he never really let it get in his way. And certainly with the disappointment of thinking he was going to be the lead in Kung Fu and then it ended up being David Carradine, and which is all in the movie and everything. So um, that all happens and jump in at any point, which actually seems to motivate him to go back to Hong Kong and make these movies, which leads to him being the star that he couldn't really uh, reach at that point in the United States. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, even his biggest supporters, there was a, a man by the name of Sterling Siliphant who was the, the equivalent of Aaron Sorkin. He was the best screenwriter of that era. And yeah. he was Bruce Lee's biggest fan, one of his students. And he took Bruce aside one day and said, look, you're a Chinese guy in a white man's world. It's never going to happen. Um, and so Bruce, even the people who loved him, you know, were basically explaining it's 1968. <laughs> like there are no Chinese stars. Um, and, it, you know, I think about it today. There still are no Chinese stars, right? Except for maybe Jackie Chan. Uh, so even today, if you were an Asian American male actor, the idea that you could be the biggest star on earth seems like a, an incredible stretch. So Bruce was trying to do this, you know, 50 years ago. Um, and it wasn't, you know, year after year, he kept coming up with projects or he would only get bit parts and he, he could feel his dream dying, I think is what happened. And suddenly an opportunity came back in his hometown of Hong Kong to star in this really low budget crappy movie that, you know, no one from the studio that was upstart and had no money, uh, but he left it the chance because uh, he needed a, a boost. And it turned out to be the biggest box office hit of Hong Kong film history, and it turned him into an overnight sensation. Um, and that's what launched his career is that he went back home after struggling in Hollywood and he made it back home. And then Hollywood came to him. And which movie was that? That was, was that the big boss? The big boss. Yeah. Right. Uh, I love, I watched it again. I went back and watched every movie after I read the book. Oh, and wow. I, I mean, this is going to be funny, but I was in Cabo by myself just getting out of town for a little while. And uh, I watched, this is a really wild night in Cabo, but I sat in my hotel room and watched the big boss because uh, I just finished the book. Because <laughs> the perfect wild night movie <laughs> right well no i'm telling you that was the night that was actually the night despite you know being fully capable of of being like all right i'm gonna i'm actually gonna go out tonight because we're in cabo but it was just i was oh. hanging out i'd finished the book and i was like i want to watch this movie again and the music holds up the music in that movie is so good and mm. you could you could hear it being part of something remixed now i'm serious like i'm like god this this music is is perfect in that kind of it's almost like an asian james bond thing that holds up over time, um, which was one of the first things that jumped out at me after watching it again. All right. I have a couple more things before I, I let you go here. Uh, he goes to Hong Kong, that studio, you think the studio situations here in the States are challenging. That was incredible. And he's making all of this money. And yet it's like this monopoly system, uh, over there. Take us through that just to, as much as you can with maybe the best details of how, how defiant Bruce was in a way that really nobody was over there knowing like, like, I don't care. Like you guys can say what you want. And these studios that were trying to control him all the time. Yeah. So what's amazing about the Hong Kong film industry at that time was it was a total monopoly of the Shaw brothers film studio run by run, run Shaw. And he had almost complete control and control in a way that we can't conceive of. Like his actors got paid like factory workers and they had to live in dorms in the compound of the studio and that they weren't allowed to go outside. They weren't allowed to fraternize. They were essentially almost like slaves working for Run Run Shaw. And one of Run Run Shaw's lieutenants by the name of Raymond Chow broke away and started his own studio, which made Run Run furious. And he basically uh, filed a bunch of lawsuits in order to sort of uh, burn all the money that Raymond Chow had raised and crushed his studio because Run Run Shaw also owned all the theaters. So he made sure that none of Raymond Chow's movies could appear in the, the best theaters in the area. 
And so Bruce Lee was trying to decide between the two studios, and he really wanted to go with Shaw Brothers because they were the big studio. And uh, Golden Harvest with Raymond Chow was just this upstart that didn't have any money. Um, but Run Run Shaw essentially told him, you know, you're going to come work for me. You're going to be m one of my slaves. And Bruce was like, fuck that. <laughs> and so he went with Raymond Chow, the upstart, for less money in order to have his own sort of freedom and artistic integrity. And I think that's one of the sort of signature choices that he made. He didn't go with the uh, safe choice. He was always throughout his career a risk taker, and this turned out to be the great reward. Because he appeared with Golden Harvest and because it was an upstart studio, they could take chances that Shaw Brothers couldn't. And this really sort of launched his career in a way that would never have happened if he had chosen the other studio. Way of the Dragon, the Coliseum fight scene with Chuck Norris. There is a legend that they actually may have fought away from everyone else and that Bruce walked back with a smile on his face and it took Chuck a little bit longer to get back. The The final scene is incredible. The Some of the comedy beats in there are like totally, I don't know if they were intended, unintended, but they work even when it feels like they don't. <laughs> That's right. well, give, me, give me the best story that you found from researching this unbelievable scene and you know, Norris coming over as, as the bad guy. And it's actually a really, you know, Bruce, I know was more involved with that movie and it just kind of shows his ability, like how amazingly talented he was in different ways. But I just want to know what you know about, or what you believe about whether or not they actually fought away from everybody. Um, yeah. So that's uh, what's great about Bruce is he's such a legend that just these stories accrue to him. Um, as far as I know, that never happened. Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris never fought for real. Um, they trained together. They eyed each other. They knew their strengths and weaknesses. But I think out of respect for each other and not wanting to damage the relationship, they never, ever went at it. Um, they filmed over in Rome. And one of the funny stories is they just paid somebody off at the Rome airport. And so when Chuck's plane lands, they, they actually filmed the real landing of Chuck's plane as he walks <laughs> off the plane um, as Colt, the American bad boy. Uh, and they, they did some exterior shots in the Coliseum, which once again, they bribed some people to get in there because you're not allowed to film there. But the majority of that fight scene was all done in Hong Kong on the studio down stages of Golden Harvest. Um, and they seem to have actually had a pretty fun time filming it. I think what was important to understand is that Bruce Lee was the star and Chuck Norris was a nobody except in the martial arts community who had not done any acting before. And so Bruce was the one teaching them the difference between movie martial arts and point fighting or sports martial arts. And he was the one teaching them how to, you know, sell a reaction, how to make, make it, make a close hit seem like a real hit. And so Chuck Norris's career is almost totally entirely due to the fact that Bruce Lee picked him out and made him his co-star in that movie. I'm so glad you brought that up because it was one of my favorite parts of the book and just anybody that's interested in movies or film or any of that thing that they paid off security people to be able to film those shots inside the Coliseum in Rome. And it like, it's just hilarious. We're like, all right, let's just bring the cameras over there. I'm like, all right, how are we going to be able to take these shots? Be like, I don't know, just pay somebody because nobody was supposed to be in there filming. Um, so I, I just want to repeat that and make sure people caught that because it's hilarious. Yeah, no, it's great. It's this, like when they talk about guerrilla filmmaking, these guys like to brag about how they're guerrilla filmmakers. But these guys really were. They show up from Hong Kong and Rome and basically are like, how much money does it take to get these things done? And that's how they did it. What's your best Enter the Dragon story? Because uh, I can't. I can't do this. I can't finish this interview without asking about that movie because it's still um, the level that the jump up in level. And it, it's almost as great as it is. It's disappointing knowing at that point, um, you know, Bruce is going to be making any movies. He died. And that movie showed another level that like he was taking it to the, the resources that were put in there. So I love that movie. I remember how I felt the first time I watched it, the whole robo scene where you're like, oh my God, like he's doing his, his philosophy in this too. And for those that haven't watched, that's, that's on you. So you can just catch up and, and watch and understand what I'm talking about, but give me your best enter the dragon story. 
So my favorite Enter the Dragon story was told to me by John Saxon when I interviewed him. Um, and the, the background for this is people don't realize, but the producers in Hollywood weren't sure an American audience would accept the Chinese hero. And that's why they had what they called an international cast or a multiracial cast of the Chinese hero, the white hero, and the uh, African-American hero. So there was three, and they weren't sure who they were going to make the star. Um, and if you read the script closely, you can see that actually the white character, John Saxon, has the better moral arc to the story um, and could easily – they could have easily recut the film to make John Saxon the star. And in fact, when they were hiring him, that's what the producers told him, which is like, don't worry about this Bruce Lee guy. You're the real star of wow. this movie. <laughs> and so – we think of this as the Bruce Lee and he's such a big deal, but he was nobody in Hollywood. John Saxon was actually a bigger deal in the West than Bruce Lee was. Uh, and so John Saxon comes over fully expecting that he's going to be the star of this film. And Bruce Lee knew this was happening behind his back. He was a very sharp guy. So what he did was he invited John Saxon over to his house and he said, I, I hear you know some martial arts. And John's like, nah, not very much, but a little bit. And he, he says, well, why don't you show me your sidekick? And he holds up a pad and John Saxon throws his, and if you've seen the film, you know he doesn't know very much. But he throws out this kind of lame sidekick and Bruce kind of nods. And he goes, well, why don't I show you mine? And he gives John Saxon the pad, stands him six feet in front of a chair that he places behind John and then does his hop, skip, jump and hits him with a sidekick that picks Saxon off the ground, flying back eight feet into the chair so powerfully that the chair breaks under Saxon, who collapses on the floor. He's staring up at the ceiling and stunned. And Bruce Lee comes over, leans over him with this concerned look on his face. And John Saxon says to him, uh, don't worry, I'm not hurt. And Bruce Lee says, I'm not worried about you. You broke my favorite chair. <laughs> So I was speaking to John Saxon and I said, did you think you were going to be the star of the movie? And he said, not after that first day. And so Bruce Lee essentially pulled a stunt from the playground and established total physical dominance in order to take over control of that movie and become the star of Enter the Dragon and the star we know today. The movie came out. Weeks after his death, correct? Uh, that was August um, 1973. Yeah. Like almost literally three, three plus weeks. Yeah, less than a month. Which is the cruelest thing because, I mean, it's not just the 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 most obvious part that a, a guy dies, but um, to die before his peak, um, to die, to not be around because of how much he would have enjoyed, uh, being an international star. And I, and I know he was a little bit, but as, as you pointed out, I watched some of your lectures where it's like most of this fame was not while he was alive. The legend of his death has been all over the place for years. Uh, you do the best job of anyone that I've ever read about really sifting through all of it. It almost feels very Bruce Lee to have it be unknown for decades about what actually happened. What happened, the lead up to his death and, and the mystery after it? So the key to understanding sort of why there's such controversy and all these conspiracy theories about Bruce Lee's death is they were trying to cover up something, but they weren't trying to cover up why he died. They were trying to cover up where he died. And the problem they faced is Enter the Dragon was about to come out and he died in his mistress's bedroom. And they didn't want the public to find out about this. So they lied about where he died, saying that he died at home, walking in his garden with his wife. And when the Hong Kong press found out that this was a deception, they just went wild. And so suddenly there were all these crazy conspiracy series stories. He was killed by the triads. He was killed by ninjas. He overdosed on drugs. Um, all of these things that have you know, today you can still find people who believe these various conspiracy theories. And no one at the time, even the, the coroner, could figure out why any scientific reason why he died. And they seem to have overlooked what I think is the most plausible explanation, which is that Bruce Lee died from heat stroke. And probably the strongest bit of evidence for that is that six months prior to his death, he had an operation to remove the sweat glands under his armpits um, in order so he wouldn't sweat on screen. And this made his body less able to dissipate heat. And anybody who's lived in Hong Kong in the summer knows how hot and humid that place is. 
And so I think it's very likely that um, he died from uh, heat stroke, um, from not being able to dissipate the heat from his body. I have one more question for you. Again, the book, Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly, Your Life. Uh, there's those of us that grew up live, you know, listening to the Wu-Tang Clan and thought, man, the Shaolin thing, this is cool. Um, you actually did it. And you're <laughs> obviously a, an academic, Princeton, Oxford. Um, what the hell motivated you to go study? And I, I think this would be fair here that you probably resemble Michael Scott a little bit more than Mike Tyson. But <laughs> what, what, what was it about you? What did your family say? When you were like, I'm going to go study with the Shaolin. Like, what What the fuck? <laughs> you yeah, know, I mean, it's man. unbelievable. Uh, even now, I look back and I was like, who is that crazy kid? Um, so a little like you, I was this kind of skinny, scrawny kid. Um, and I grew up in Topeka, Kansas. It's kind of a rough, blue-collar town. And I was always getting knocked around on the playground. And so Bruce Lee, when I saw Enter the Dragon as a 12 or 13-year-old, became my role model, my inspiration. And I wanted to be as tough and badass as Bruce Lee. And in, in the, Enter the Dragon, he's a Shaolin monk. Um, and so I got to college and I was really following along Bruce's path. I was studying philosophy, Eastern Taoism, et cetera, and studying, you know, Southern Kung Fu. Uh, and one day I thought, you know, I want to go to China and learn martial arts. Um, and I talked to a teacher who said, you got to go to the Shaolin Temple, which I thought was a made-up place. I didn't think it actually existed. And because I had been such a childhood fan of Bruce Lee, that just – it seemed like destiny, right? Um, and so I, I went back home to my father in Kansas and said, I'm going to drop out of college and go to a Buddhist monastery in China and study Kung Fu. And he looked at me like an alien had possessed his son. Um, and – you know, eventually I was so determined, I ended up hopping on a plane and, and going over there and studying uh, Kung Fu with the Shaolin monks for two plus years. And that ended up sort of completely changing the course of my life. So in a weird way, I felt like writing this book about Bruce Lee, the, auto, the first sort of authoritative biography, was a way to thank him for uh, what he did to change the course of my life. I feel like I could do another 45 minutes on you. Um, what is it like when you get off the plane and, and show up to the temple with your bags? Like what, <laughs> what happens? It, it's, well, it's crazy because um, it, this is like in 1992, uh, before the internet, et cetera. So I just showed up with a bag and I expected it to be like a scene from Kung Fu where you knock on the door and they don't let you in and you have to sit there for months waiting. So I packed a like sleeping bag thinking I was going to have to camp outside the Shaolin temple until they let me in. But it turned out um, that th by that point, the government had taken the place over and they were running it to make money. And as soon as I showed up with American cash, they were like, yep, you can come right in. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got to be a, a disciple of the Shaolin temple is I just paid up front. Do you only have the one fight to your record? I don't know. Cause I watched your, the one that's on YouTube where you fought a guy, uh, and was that the I don't know if there's MMA in the cage. Was that MMA? And I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that to be like a jerk. I just, it, it no, looked no, very no. stand up. It, it just, obviously neither of you had any interest in going to the ground. Um, which, right. you know, I, I don't, I don't blame you, um, because it sucks down there, but I just, so that was MMA, but it, it, I watching, I was like, I don't know if this is kickboxing, but I was looking at his hands and you know, his, his hands were positioned in, in a different way than yours. So I, I guess I felt like, okay, maybe this, this is sort of a, and the gloves were MMA gloves. So I, I just, yep. I couldn't quite figure it out. And you won, man, you won. He didn't get out of the corner. Um, was that the one, was that the one time or, cause I know you wrote in another book about training for that. So I didn't know if those two were connected. Uh, yeah, so the that was from the second book, uh, Tapped Out, okay. when I was yeah significantly older, and that was an MMA fight. But we were both, since we were both young and inexperienced, they matched up two stand-up guys um, to face each other. Um, I did a couple smokers in preparation for that, um, you know, uh, some boxing ones, et cetera. Uh, but when I was at Shaolin, I ended up fighting in a kickboxing, a Chinese-style kickboxing tournament. Um it was like an international one with a bunch of countries uh, sending people. So I I had done tournaments before. So probably three or four official um, 
competitions uh, uh, underneath. But, you know, obviously that's very different from the fighters of today who have hundreds of fights under their belt. Hey, you got in there, man. You got in there. And uh, over 90% of the people walking around would would never even do that. So uh, give yourself some credit for that. And also give yourself credit for uh, a great way to tie in this entire interview by saying you wrote the book as, as a thank you to him. You did a great job. I know it was years of research and it was really enjoyable and I would urge everybody. There's so many other stories in there, the Steve McQueen stuff, Bruce is a driver, uh, stuff on on the set. He definitely um, liked the ladies. So check it out. Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly. Thanks for this, man. And uh, thanks for this time because I've, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. It was great. Is the best way to follow you? What's the best way for people to kind of get a sense of how to get your information and, and follow what you're doing? Um, well, I, a website, Matt Polly, M A T T P O L L Y dot com, or I'm on Twitter, uh, Matthew E. Polly. Uh, and of course, the book's available Amazon, Barnes and Noble, everywhere. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Okay. Just make sure you uh, rate and review and subscribe to the Rosillo podcast here on the ring. We'll have a new one for you coming up on Friday and then doing some NBA stuff coming up here soon with Bill. So uh, looking forward to that as well. Thanks. Thanks.